Welcome to Confronting Campus Controversy. And I bet you can't say that three times fast, but we'll try it later. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce to you our three speakers. So our first speaker is going to be Matt Lamb, and he serves as Students for Life of America's Director of Communications. And he is a Chicago native and works to expand social media outreach, rapid response, and media relations. And then we also have Anne-Marie Pariso with us, and she serves on the public relations team for Alliance Defending Freedom, and she's worked on cases all the way up in the Supreme Court, and she has over 10 years of experience in development, communications and radio, television, and the written word for nonprofits and political campaigns. And then we also have Christy Hamrick, and she's the media strategist for Students for Life of America, She's a media consultant with years of experience working as a reporter. She's worked in a variety of socially conservative groups, but she now works for Students for Life of America and lives in Tennessee with her family. Matt's going to go ahead and open up for us. Please welcome Matt Lane. All right, so anyone else here from uh, Illinois? Woo! Where are you from? Nice. Yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, cool. So I'm Matt. I'm the director of communications for Students for Life of America. Um, so we deal with any uh, text message, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Snapchat, Reddit, all of that. Um, and then we create all the videos, uh, a lot of the graphic design, and then we also handle like the blogs, the student listservs, media, which Christy does and she'll talk about, um, so everything like that. So I just want to talk briefly about um, the process if you have a free speech issue or a legal issue on your campus, as well as um, what kind of good stories you can always send our way. So the email address you can always send it to is comms, C-O-M-M-S, at studentsforlife.org, or you can always email your regional coordinator and they can get it to us. Um, so has anyone here ever had a story that that I help them with, or any free speech issue that students like help them with? Um, cool, what's your name? Okay, cool, what was the? Oh yeah, right, oh yeah, go Mavs. I'll start there. Um, cool, cool, cool. And then I think I saw Allie and Vicky over there. Nice, um, awesome, so there's a lot, in Marcos, right? Cool, so what we do is if you have a controversy on your campus, um, we will help you confront it, right? All of our this. Um, so a couple great, couple great tips I just want to give. So if you if there's something happening, always contact us as early as possible um, because the earlier we get involved, obviously the easier it will be. Um, but it's also never too late to contact us. So a couple things. So um, we can obviously have free speech issues um, or you might have been discriminated against in class, um, or maybe you were on campus and you had this like interaction with a professor um, where they came up to your table. So always send us any pictures, videos, summaries of what happened. Um, when you're preparing to start a group, what's always great is start a paper trail. Do everything over email. Um, a lot of times, especially, how many high school students do we have in here? Okay, cool. This happens a lot with high schoolers. The principal will be like, hey, uh, let's just talk in my office. Um, and I understand it's like it's scary. You don't necessarily want to like talk back to your principal. And obviously, I'm not saying be disrespectful. Um, but in the event that they kind of pull you into the office to tell you, like, hey, we can't approve your group because it's too controversial or because like it's religious or anything silly like that. Uh, has anyone heard that before? Cool, cool. Um, always let us know. What you can always do, too, is email your principal after the fact. Be like, hey, I just want to follow up from our meeting we had where you said I couldn't start a Students for Life group because X, Y, Z. And you want to always want to create some sort of paper trail. So when Christy and I are going to the media and we need some sort of proof to say like, no, this really happened, right? Um, because as hard as it may seem to believe, the media, at least the local media, does actually fact check things. Um, so we always need to be able to show them an email um, and even a recounting of a conversation needs some sort of paper trail. So that's really important. Um, Really the most important thing is just remember that um, if you can turn your story into something that looks really bad on a headline, like uh, Women's Center takes down posts by female writer, uh, right Vicki, like that looks really bad. And if you get on Breitbart, it looks even worse on the school and they back down really quickly. Um, or like if your school 
Um, or the state school that used for your tax dollars says you can't go into a public event, like what happened to Allie with Cecile Richards, which is billed as a public event, and you get video of it, and you contact the media. Um, it's a really great way to put pressure on them. So always feel free to reach out to me. My email is online, just mlam at studentsforlife.org. Photos, emails, blogs. If you have great stories on campus, you raise a lot of money for uh, pregnant and parenting students on campus, or you just have a really successful tabling day or something like that, uh, feel free to reach out. So that's the basis of how I can help. And then next, uh, Christy's gonna talk about, um, let's say you're on campus and you're having an event and the media comes up or how to promote your event, basic media relations. Christy? Thanks. So I come to you from the dark side. I was a reporter for more than 10 years. I have a journalism poli sci degree. And then after that, all I've ever done is talk to the reporters. So this gives me a very truncated conversation in which I will try to keep it clean, <laughs> as that would say. But this is the big thing I want to tell you about working with the reporters. The number one thing you need to remember is that your job is not to answer anyone's questions. And I want you guys to say that. My job, My job is, not is not to answer anyone's questions. Answer anyone's questions. It's very significant. Your job is to represent your group, your position, your event, but not them. You're not there for them. And a lot of times people try to make it out like we're lion tamed. We're going to go talk to the media. We need to be terrifying. They're the lions. You're the Christians which worked for very few except maybe Daniel. And the point here is that that's not what we're doing. That's not what we're doing at all. They are used car salesmen and you are a buyer. That's who they are. There needs to be an economic exchange of information. And you need to prepare for that. How many people here have purchased their own car? Anybody? OK. So you go into the place you're going to buy a car. The guy says to you first, what do you want to spend? And the answer is, it's none of your business. <laughs> you know. <laughs> It's none of your business, their business, whether there's fighting in your group. It's none of their business about the backstory. It's none of their business about how do you feel about war and peace or the death penalty or whatever else, because your job is not to say things until they are, feel that they can appropriately embarrass you. Your job is only to represent your position. So the first thing you have to do when you're going into an economic exchange with a reporter, because they do need information, and you, you need to sell information, is you need to have generally three things that you're ready to say. How many things? Three. How many things? Three. How many do we not want to have? <laughs> All of the above. That's right, because you don't have time. You don't have time to say five things. And the reason why you really only have time for three is you need facts to back up everything that you're saying, so then three becomes six. And six might become nine if you have two facts to back it up. What do you need to have to back up every statement that you're making? Facts. Right. It's unemotional. That's why you need the emails that Matt is making. That's why you need to have the letter that you sent when you asked for the event. That's why you need to know what your event's about. I want to invite Cecile Richards or Abby Johnson or Kristen Hawkins or whomever. Here's the letter that I sent. Fact one, I wanted to have a free speech event. Here's my letter. So here's my, my details. Here's my proof. Fact two, they said no. Here's my fact, here's my statement. Fact three, I'm a student. I have a right to express my opinion. Here's the Constitution. Look it up. <laughs> you know? But you only have so much time and you need facts. You need to be ready for every statement of fact. One of the easy ways in which the media will discredit you is they will try to make you talk about things that you don't know about. How many people in this room are lawyers? Exactly. <laughs> How many people in this room are medical physicians? Right. You're a medical physician? We have, did somebody raise a hand? Anyway, so what I'm saying is, I don't see a lot of doctors or lawyers. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So the most important thing you need to know when you're talking to the media is who you are and who you are not. Because who you are not gets you out of a lot of trouble. So I am talking to reporters all the time. I do it consistently. And somebody is saying to me, well, you know, in, uh, in the Hyde Amendment, in section this, such a da 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 da, you know, they want to drill down on the law. No, I actually do know a lot about the law. But one of the first things I do when I do not want to answer a question is I start by saying who I'm not. Well, I'm not a lawyer. Well, I'm not a doctor. I could get you one if you'd like. And what you could say is, I'm not a lawyer, but Students for Life could find you one. I'm not a doctor, but we could get you those resources. But the reason I'm here today is X. So you don't want to answer a question. What do you do? Tell them who you're not. 
No, you're not. That's, you're not that thing. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not that. I'm not a teacher at the school. I'm not a doctor. But what I am is, and that's really important. Maybe you're the organizer of the event. Maybe you're a student at the school. Maybe you're a person from the community. The reason you need to know who you are is, why should anybody talk to you on this issue? So again, what I'm asking you to know is, before you go in, you have three things you're trying to say, and you know who you are. Give me some examples of who you might be in a story, because this is very important. Who might you be in a story? Has anybody ever talked in the press? Who were you in the story? A writer. A writer, OK. Anybody else? Who were you in the story? Reporter. You were the reporter? OK. That's an important role. Who were you in the story? I was interviewed. For why? Why were you interviewed? Uh, yesterday at the march. As what? Um, it was these people from Paris, and they were trying to like, get a scope of what's going on in America. So OK. So you were, involved, you were a participant in the event? Yes. In any story, there are only so many roles that can be filled. There's a victim. There's an advocate. There's an activist. There's an expert. There is a decision maker. So the decision maker might be the principal of the school. The decision maker could be a legislator. The decision maker could be you, because you decided that you're pissed off, and so you're going to have an event. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Somebody acted in that story. Somebody had a choice to make. Maybe you called Students for Life, and so you're a decision maker, because you're interested in filing a lawsuit, which we will learn more about in a minute. But somebody made a decision. Somebody is an activist. Somebody is an expert. Know who you are and who you're not, because who you're not is going to get you out of a lot of trouble, OK? So do we all agree we're not lawyers, right? I'm not a lawyer. We all agree we're not doctors. We all agree that we probably don't work with the organization that's making us angry, right? Well, I'm not here to represent the school, but as a student, da 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 da, -da. See what I'm saying? Who I am and who I'm not, these are really, really important things to keep in mind. And you need to know this ahead of time or you'll be wrong. Because if it's your opinion, or your activism, or your story, stay very narrowly focused on the thing that you are, are so that you won't get screwed up by, by what you say. Because then it's always from a position of strength. Then you're always talking about the thing that you truly know, and you're avoiding saying the wrong thing because you're careful not to be more than you are. Does that make sense? If you say that you're more than you are, you'll embarrass yourself. Because you're not a doctor, you're not a lawyer, you're not whatever, but you're important. You're important to that story, and if you stay focused on that, your interview will be a success. All right, can you all hear me? Yes. Awesome. I don't normally have to ask that. I don't even need a mic usually. So. Um, I have a short public service announcement before I begin. Um, if you guys like the t-shirt I'm wearing, it says, um, the answer is more speech. You can have it for free. All I need you to do is fill out this card at the end of the talk. So find me, or uh, there might be another representative uh, in that corner, but uh, fill out a card and grab a t-shirt downstairs at the Alliance Defending Freedom booth. Um, so my name is Anne Marie, and I work for Alliance Defending Freedom, and I just want to say first that you guys are awesome, SFLA is awesome. Um, the first time I went to the march, I actually attended the SFLA conference, and it was a game changer for me. Um, even you introverts, please like network with your fellow peers in the pro-life movement. You guys are the, a future generation. Um, you guys are the ones that are um, going to be the next face of the pro-life movement. So um, get together with your peers, make friends, and you guys will be working together in the next 10, year, 10 or 15 years. Um, so I work on the public relations team, as I mentioned. Is anybody familiar with Alliance Defending Freedom? OK, great, so some of you. Um, for those of you who aren't, we are a nonprofit legal advocacy group. We litigate, we educate, we advocate on the issues of uh, religious freedom, freedom of speech, um, in many different areas. So we concentrate in um, college campuses. We make sure that students um, have their right to speak freely. We um, represent um, clients who are uh, attacked because of their religious beliefs. Um, in the life arena, we have represented healthcare professionals, former Planned Parenthood employees, students, sidewalk counselors, pro-life pregnancy centers, um, and adoptive providers. 
Um, last year, if you guys follow the news, back in March, um, we represented NIFLA. NIFLA, uh, we were fighting a California law that was targeting and forcing pro-life pregnancy centers to advertise for the abortion industry. That worked its way up to the Supreme Court, and by God's grace, we um, have a victory. Um, yes! <laughs> so I, as I work on the public relations team, I often work with, of course, our attorneys, our clients, um, my colleagues, and the media. And I want to focus on my, how I work with the media on a regular basis. And of course, because I covered all these issues that ADF represents, we have a lot of cases um, always at the ready to talk about. Um, first of all, media are people too. Um, we want to respect them, um, at least I do, <laughs> and my organization recognizes the gifts and talents that they have that they bring to their work and we want to respect that. So we approach them with love and dignity, um, <clears throat> with carefulness, but with love and dignity. Um, we want to make sure that they're also successful at their work, and to do that, we want to make um, our pitches relevant, newsworthy to them. I'm not going to pitch a pro-life pregnancy story to someone who writes for the NFL. It's kind of common sense. We, we care about what the readers um, pay attention to, and we care about the reporters and what they write on. Um, we, want, we provide the media with facts and not spin. I don't give them a bunch of my opinions. I give them, hey, here are the facts of the case. Here are the compelling stories that, you, that I think your readers would be interested in. Um, they're not going to listen to opinion. Um, do not give fake news. We want to make sure that they receive facts. Um, we don't want to give them um, incorrect information. Otherwise, they're not going to, we're not going to have a good relationship. They're going to get in trouble with their editors or whoever they work with, and it's not going to be pretty. Um, be helpful. If they need images, give them images. If they need B-roll, be sure um, to give them B-roll. Um, and then one, th I think this is my favorite thing. Um, I work with a lot of cases. I work with a lot of reporters. Um, and when I sit down with them and talk to them about the issues at hand, I, I see their, it's not that their minds completely change, but very often they say, you know, I've never actually thought about an issue that way. Um, I've never heard that reported before. That's crazy. Um, and they're not, they're not friendly to our cause. But people who, um, they want as much information as possible and I give it to them, um, they're happy. And their minds can change. And that's what we want. We want people to see the, a bigger picture um, than what is, is reported oftentimes. Um, and then just basic couple things for you guys. I know um, you're very active on college campuses. If you interact with the media, we want to see your smiling, beautiful faces. Um, optics are really important. We want them to see we're not an angry movement. We are a joy-filled movement. Um, and then other grassroots -y things you can do. Um, we're from all across the country. Research, research um, legislation that's happening in your state and maybe write an opinion on it and then submit it to your local paper. Um, I was a quasi-nerd in high school. I really liked politics. Um, there's a presidential election going on. I'm not going to tell you which one. I don't want to date myself. Um, but I wrote, I wrote a, a piece, an opinion piece, about just the current election cycle. Um, and a very liberal news article took it and, and put it in their newspaper. Um, and then lastly, you guys use social media all the time. Like, highlight really amazing stories um, of the pro-life pregnancy centers that you see, of women who are in difficult situations, who made that very difficult choice to accept life. Um, highlight their stories on social media. Um, write about them again and submit it to your local paper. Um, and then lastly, like, if you guys want any updates on ADF, go to adflegal.org. We have a lot of cases going on. Very interesting. Follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Alliance Defense. And don't forget to pick up your card. Thank you. Um, so we're just going to open up to questions, anything about um, free speech, legal issues, although using Chrissy's tip, none of us are lawyers, so we can't like give you legal advice, but we can give you tips on what to start preparing and then things like that, um, or stories you want to share. So all the questions, yeah. Okay, what is the legal standing of, of uh, an opposition person trying to destroy your materials, like on the campus, 
And we now see these videos where various groups, uh, pro-life groups are attacked and their stuff is, is vandalized, destroyed, or covered up. A really egregious case with a 30-minute video has a woman, in, I believe in Toronto, Canada, totally destroying a post-abortive group where they're just sitting there giving their testimonies, taking the stuff off the table, <coughs> filming herself while she's doing it, physically picking up the stuff, throwing it in the trash, coming back and said, you brought off more materials, now these are going to be thrown in the trash. And she was aggressively abusing them and then they didn't respond and so forth. So what do you do? Sure. So uh, let me just answer, I guess, how we would handle it. Obviously, it I'm happens not... to us all the time. Yeah. I mean, at Students for Life, Kristen for thirty I, minutes, when, and then when you put it back out, they pick it back up it and throw it in the trash. And all the time. Right. Wow. People we'll come, they throw the stuff over, they destroy it. We put out these um, these cemetery of the innocents with crosses, and they'll be destroyed, and we put them up again, and they take them down. The profanity. We had a girl last year struck praying outside. Uh, Kristen Hawkins has an op-ed at the Wall Street Journal where we looked at the nine common violations of student free speech, including physical violence, destruction of property. The, the most important thing you need to do is get your camera out and start filming, number one. Number two, call the police. Number three, make a complaint with the administration. You, and, and you need a paper trail for all of that. But this happens to us constantly. And, uh, and prayerfully, uh, we are concerned for the safety of our people. When people go to the Supreme Court, we have security there for them. So we're finding more and more that just to speak for, for, for life, we have to physically protect ourselves. But document, call police, call the administration. The response is not to do anything, just let them do it and physically destroy the material. Well, the response is to get it on film and then right. send the film to us yeah. and then we will have fun with it. <laughs> that's, that's the response. And, and then you've got the documentation. And you will have how many points to say about this thing? Three. You will have three. You will say you set it out and you had a permit and here's my permit and here's my videotape and here's my complaint. Here's the name of the officer I called. Three. Three. And you were there exercising your free speech rights. But you've got to document, and then you have to be prepared because you have every right to speak. And we are finding that th that's not something that happens to us sometimes. That, that happens to us easily, what, Matt, about once a week? So we Twice a week? We, we, I mean, we created, a, we created a map. And I mean, we went back eight years. And so these were only incidents that I could find articles for or things on our blog, something I could cite. Because I'm sure it happens a lot to you all and we don't even hear about it. Um, please do tell us. Even if you think it's one poster, it doesn't matter. Like, we want to keep track of all this. Um, and I think we're up to, like, almost 80 or 90 instances in, this like, year. eight. Well, I was going to say in the past six, seven years. But obviously, we know we're missing, like, a lot. So it definitely, I think one group in Texas, is anyone here from, is it San Antonio or? One of the groups had, it tore, had posters for an Abby Johnson event torn down, like, five times in three weeks. And anyone here from Miami, Ohio? Yeah. Their Cemetery of the Innocence, I think, was vandalized, what, five times in five days or something? Yeah. Allie's group? It yeah. happens to us all the time. all group, sorry. Yeah, 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 exactly. So do you have anything you want to add? How to do it? Cool. But that's a good question. Get your cameras out and start filming. And film Everything. landscape, not vertically. <laughs> yeah. There's a second part of the advice, but I won't say it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Marcus. They only can dictate where they, you table if they dictate it for everyone. Okay. Because this is about fairness. Um, this is about you knowing what the rules are. And there are some rules that they can use against you. Like they can't, this is what's happened to pro-life groups where you come in and you want to have a pro-life event and they're like, well, we're forced to let you have it but there'll be a $5,000 security fee. Unless they charge everybody a security fee, they can't charge you one. Unless they restrict where other people speak, they can't restrict yours. And we are looking into whether or not they really can jail you in a so-called free speech zone. And we've had some luck on some campuses saying no. But again, and I know we're harping on this, but this has got to do with your three points. Document everything, your request to have an event, and where they said you had to have it, and whether your student code forces everybody to be there because that's all part of your story, that you were trying to exercise your rights. And so that's part of your documentation that you can come back with later and then film as much as you can. And, and I, we will have some fun. Can I? Yeah. Actually, uh, on that, um, it is really important to document. And I would say um, a lot of Alliance Defending Freedom's work on campus is dealing with these um, free speech zones. Um, we had a case in Michigan. Anybody from Michigan? 
All right, awesome. Um, we had a we had a case at Kellogg Community College where a couple students were handing out the U.S. Constitution. They were arrested for it, and um, <laughs> so we we. We, we dealt with it, we, it was the settlement, it was, a, it was a good outcome for the students and the university was able to reverse its policy, um, but our attorneys at Alliance Defending Freedom would definitely be able to tell you if, if we have um, I, ability to, to confront the university on, their, on that particular policy. Uh, other questions? This one over here. But... Yeah. Yeah, here's the thing. Let oh. me give you a couple pieces of advice on that. Number one, don't say very much. You can't be misquoted if you don't say very much. So then you keep it super short. Uh, the way, you know, at Students for Life that I deal with hostile reporters is I do that generally in writing. If I'm going to get the Huffington Post or somebody that I think is really out to probably make us look bad, I like to do all those on email and writing and then have one line so it, all you can quote is the one line I gave you. Matt and I do this all the time. Also, that way I can vet that they're a real reporter and they're not out to get me. So I want to know who I'm talking to. Uh, so if you're out, don't have a conversation with someone who's not there to listen. You know, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And if he doesn't have ears to hear, then don't talk to him. Uh, and just one sentence. And I've sat down with reporters, um, and I've said the same sentence ten times in a row, and they're like, look, I want to ask you something else. And I'm like, that's all I have to say. <laughs> so just keep it super short if they're hostile. And no is an answer. You know, I've already answered the question. Is a sufficient answer? And I would say, um, from my point of view, with my organization, um, you know, we get requests from all over the docket, and you have to be um, really vigilant about what interviews you take. You, you, you don't have to take every single interview that's offered to you, especially if they're going to truly um, be slanderous um, or, or very, very openly hostile. The last piece of it, are you talking a lot, too, about, like, student newspapers at your school? Yeah, but so obviously one, if you tell us a story, we're helping to publicize it. I don't know how much we can do in the United States, but um, uh, in addition to their advice, I would say too, like keeping that paper trail, we actually had a situation, Dylan sitting in front of me at TCNJ, when they stole their flags, and the student newspaper, I don't know if Christy remembers this, a lot of times the student newspapers, um, yeah, yeah, but because they're, you know, they're student reporters, and I was a student reporter too, I wrote for the College Fix and College Conservative and places like that, and so you're still learning, and so you don't necessarily know the journalistic code of ethics and things like that and procedures. Um, and they, oh, they said you all were going to go steal flags from somewhere else, but it was actually the student who stole. It's actually very convoluted. Yeah, so basically what happened is they were putting up a cemetery in a sense, and then these students who were pro-choice came and stole their flags. And then there was an exchange where there was another group that was unaffiliated with the university, and it sounded like they were going to go steal uh, like a rainbow flag from the Pride Center, but it was actually the students who stole their flag saying, let's go take it to counter pro protest like these street preachers or something. And we were like, that's actually not what happened. Like, it wasn't our group. It was these students who stole our flag saying we're going to go counter pro protest someone else. And they said, oh, well, we'll correct it in the next online edition. And we're like, well, it's online. Just go into WordPress and change it. And we actually went to their advisor and was like, hey, here's the situation. Like, yes, we understand it's already printed. So in the next printed version, printed correction, but you should really put up a correction right away. And the advisor, who's an adult, you know, faculty member, was a, went in and fixed it for us. So, but we had that documentation. We were able to show them the video. So that's the best in addition to what they said. So cool. Uh, other, Dylan, did you want? Yes. Oh, do you have a question? 
Okay, yeah. Re regarding that incident, um, just to show that our group maintains solidarity, we do want to, at the anniversary of, um, anniversary of that incident, we want to have the flag garden up again. And um, how do you suggest, um, is there anything you can suggest we do differently to be more successful this time around? Sure. Guard um, it. Yeah, guard it. Um, I think at Miami they started getting... It was, it was me. So, so you can buy you can buy uh, cameras that you can hide in the trees. The Leadership Institute has done that before. And then um, if since you have a documented case and the university owes you a lot, um, you should request that they put like posted security um, around. And then obviously during the day, having multiple people there with your phones like you did last time. But don't be afraid, y'all, that this, it's not a failure if they attack your stuff. That is a failure on their part. It is a failure of imagination, and it's also a failure of the imagination of us. You know, we will help you have fun with this. You know, their inability to see across in the ground is telling, you know. And honestly, y'all, we have fun. We have a lot of fun. We want you to go, but guard it <laughs> with a camera. Also, what did you say? On landscape. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> no, but garden. Oh, and the other thing, too, that reminds me is, so the same principles that hold for when you're talking to a reporter work in the reverse when you're the one that's a reporter. If people are saying stupid things to you about your display, just let them talk and just get it all. Don't right. interrupt. Just let don't interrupt them. Let them say everything they want, and then we will put it out in a very colorful way, and we will all have some fun. And never stop someone who's saying something stupid, you know? And also never be the person saying something stupid. These are two and rules. Before getting the next question, let me also just throw there, if you're ever on campus and you want to send us a lot of good footage and you're arguing with pro-choicers, ask them, like, do you think abortion should be allowed up until like the moment of birth? You'll get a lot of people being like, yes, Send us that video, I will make you famous. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a question? Wait, some, wait. Uh, I did, yeah. First of all, I just want to thank you all for the good work you're doing. I, I really, I think we all have very much appreciate it. Uh, and secondly, in cases that you've worked, um, where there's been, um, where free speech has been impeded and y'all have lost, I was wondering if you could share examples of what that might have looked like and what we can do to See, I would argue we haven't lost. Let's say that you try to have an event. Let's say you try to have an event and you've documented it, which if we haven't been anal enough on that point, and you've documented it with everything you can do, and then they say no, and then you can really embarrass these people, and then I can go to the next level up. So the local school or the local whatever, they said no, and then you go one level up to the local press, and then I can go to the state meeting, then I can go to Breitbart, then I can go to Fox News, and then we can embarrass them painfully. And maybe you end up having to have an event right off campus, but then everybody comes because now they're curious. I mean, think about the people where, like a Ben Shapiro can't come, and so they go to a local hotel. So did they get more, would they have gotten more attention if they just quietly let the man come and speak? Or did they get more attention when they said no, and people got mad, and then Fox talked about it, then they go off site, you know what I'm saying? Like a loss isn't always a loss when people look like the narrow-minded, unable to understand that there is life in the womb kind of people, you know, it's like, they, the fact that you're so upset that someone's gonna say this on your campus becomes, communicatively interesting from my perspective. And from, from a legal perspective, uh, I'm not a lawyer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, ADF Center for Academic Freedom, I mean, our win rate is pretty much at like 90% or so, so I'm grateful and blessed that we haven't had a ton of losses. Um, but I would definitely suggest that you, because that's a fantastic question, that you speak um, with one of our attorneys about you know, the implications of losses, and I, I think that would be an interesting conversation. Do you have a question? So without getting too much into specific, like one code versus another law, just the constitutional guarantee of the First Amendment 
Trump would trump any state or local law. That's probably much as I can say. But we, but it's like I said with the security fee. We have found if the rules are the same for everybody, if there's a rule for an application for an event or a rule for, for security or rule for whatever, if, but if they're fair about it, it's what we've done, like, and you might want to talk about this with the trigger warnings where they're going to hang up a sign saying, don't go by this display because you might be offended because it's pro-life. But if they only do that, do that for pro-life people, we have won in court, we have won against administration. So it's the, it's the unfair application of it. If, if they're restricting everybody in a public campus in the same way, sometimes they can do it, but they can't signal, single you out. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about trigger awards, but you guys have had great success winning <laughs> against them. ADF has really done a great job saying you can't go onto a campus and stop pro-life speech. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, why don't we give it up again for our great panel here. Thank you. And thank you so much, everyone. If you guys want to